Okay, so welcome everyone to today's the One Word Mind Seminar. Today, it's my great pleasure to have Dr. Johannes Malé at the University of Eichstatt, Ingolstadt in our seminar. Uh, Johannes obtained his PhD degree at Technical University of Munich in 2019, and he is currently a postdoc working on mathematics of data science and machine learning, in particular on compressive sensing and the quantization. And recently, he shifted his research interest to the recovery of multiple structured signals, covariance estimation, approximation property of neural networks, and the implicit bias of gradient descent. So today he will talk about why gradient descent is so biased. Johannes, the stage is yours, and I thank you very much. Well, thanks, Shian, for the nice introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, so let's let me first emphasize that this is joint work with Edward Cho, who is also here in the in the audience. Uh, Carsten Gieshoff, who was a, a master student of Holger Rauhut at Aachen, and also Holger. Um, and so if you have any questions, if something is unclear, please just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I will be happy to clarify anything. So the talk, let's see. Now it works. Okay, the talk is about about some some phenomenon that happens when when using gradient descent for optimization, and since it was somehow discovered or in some sense uh, made famous in context of deep learning, I would start with a, a short introduction on this motivation and then go into the main topic of our talk. And in some sense. The mystery of deep learning starts with this recent success that neural networks and especially deep neural networks have become somehow the state of the art tool uh, for, for certain tasks like image classification, speech recognition, all the, these things one somehow connects to, to human learning. And the problem is that we still don't really know exactly from a theoretical point why this works so well and how reliable it is. And um, to see why this is mysterious, maybe the best is to compare it to the classical supervised learning setup. And this means in, in classical machine learning, you would say you're given some training data, which consists of input data xi and output data yi. And you consider some hypothesis class of possible explanations that connect the x's with the y's in a suitable way. And now the, the thing you want to do is um, you want to find in this hypothesis class the best, the best explanation by in some sense comparing um, certain explanations in the hypothesis class by a loss function. So you compare how they predict the output in comparison to the outputs you know. And if, if your hypothesis class is large, you often try to regularize uh, by, by searching for a simple explanation. So for example, you might add a regularizer that, that enforces a certain kind of simplicity in your age. Um, and you call this L loss function and R the regularizer. Now in this classical setup, there are three scenarios that normally might happen. Either you have so the, the green points are, are the data points. Either you have a hypothesis class that is too small, so you don't have enough explanation possibilities to get a good explanation, or you have a, a suitable explanation class, then you get a good explanation of the data that might also generalize to new points, or you have too many explanations, which means you can fit the data perfectly, but if there is noise on the data, then it's very likable, likely that, uh, that you, you take a too complicated explanation, which will not generalize to new points. And at the same time, you could also connect this to regularization. You could say, even if you have a huge class of explanations, the, the overfitting setting would correspond to not adding an enforcement of simplicity. The balanced setting would correspond to having a good regularization procedure. And the underfitting would correspond to having too much regularization. So although you have many explanations, you want so simple explanations that it doesn't suffice to explain data anymore. Now, what is the problem in, in neural networks is, or what we don't understand, that 
deep neural networks are a very rich hypothesis class. So you have millions of trainable parameters, which means the you basically can fit any data. You can even fit Gaussian noise. But at the same time, you do regularize, you do not need regularization if you optimize this uh, this training with uh, gradient descent. But in some sense, there there are simple there is a preference for simple explanations of the data. And this in some way suggests that the gradient descent algorithm implicitly has a regularization towards simple explanations. The question is, how, how does this work and how can one express this mathematically? And since this original model of deep neural networks is already very complicated, a good step is to somehow simplify it to, to make it better approachable in, in theoretical terms. And so in the first part of the talk, I will, I will speak about the first paper Edward, Holger, Carsten and me did together. And in this case, we first looked at how to simplify the setting to a matrix factorization setup and then analyze this. So to see how this works, I will just start with how, with the training setup for, for a general feedforward network architecture. And I guess most of you have seen this before, but let's go through it anyway. Then you know the, the notation and it's easy for you to get into, into our paper or our work. So a feedforward network is a function that maps from some input space to some output space. And the main feature of this function is that it is defined layer-wise, where each of the layer, layers is a simple function composed of an affine transformation and a nonlinear activation function. And the important things are that the weight matrices and the bias vectors are free to be chosen. So those are the parameters over which you can optimize. And the sigma acts entry-wise. Supervised training in such, a, in such a network setting means now for given training data, x, i, y, i, to optimize this function where the inner thing is the empirical loss. So you pick some loss function of your liking and you somehow you measure the average error in predicting the data. And you minimize over all the possible parameters. Since this is a model that is hard to analyze, we start simplifying it. So the first step is we pick, oh, sorry, question is why does gradient descent find good global optimizers of that? Um, to, 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 to analyze this, we, we want to simplify it. So the first step is that um, we pick a certain loss. And for our case, we just start with the quadratic loss which is nice because now this sum becomes kind of a norm. Um, the second step is we forget about the nonlinearity for the moment. And um, we also forget about bias terms. The, the motivation behind this is that the layers now are simple matrix vector multiplications and the network becomes a linear network in the sense that it is just a product of matrices times the input. And this we can rewrite as minimizing this uh, Frobenius norm difference over the weight matrices. And now there's one last step, um, which assumes in some sense, if our training data spans the input space, so this might not always be given in reality, but let's for the moment assume that X spans the input space, then our X and Y determine the product of those uh, matrices if you want to achieve zero training error. So in some sense, you can replace the training data by a ground truth matrix W hat of which you want to compute a factorization um, by minimizing over the factors. And this is now a matrix factorization model. So in some sense, the neural network idea completely vanished, but you see that intrinsically it's still encoded in this, in this model. So we forget everything up to this point and we concentrate on this model. What do we wanna do? 
we want to minimize this via gradient descent and gradient descent shall be applied to each of these factors. This means we have to make some assumptions on what we are doing. First of all, we say that all the dimensions of the matrix are the same. So there is no bias induced by the matrix dimensions. For example, if one of the ends in the middle would be very small, we all already have a low rank bias just by the dimensions. And this we don't want to have. And the second thing is, this is for technical simplicity. We assume that our ground truth is symmetric. This has the advantage that we can always compute um, eigenvalue decompositions. And now we can define gradient descent on this thing. It looks a bit technical, but what is written here is just the, the standard vanilla gradient descent algorithm for each of the factors. And it is applied to each of the factor iteratively. Um, what we now say for the rest of, of this section is that we call the loss function L this Frobenius difference squared. We define WK to be the kth product matrix. And alpha, eta are the initialization magnitude and the step size of the gradient descent. So now the question, does the trajectory of this gradient descent algorithm exhibit any implicit bias towards some structures? If we converge to global optimality, of course, we will always end up with this product. But the question is, is there happening anything interesting along the way? And what is also interesting is to understand what is the influence of the, of the layer depth, so how many factors we have. Can I ask one yeah. question, sorry? Um, sure. Can you repeat um, why the, you have to uh, do the gradient descent on each of the W separately? Um, I, I lost this. I think this would correspond in some sense to the back propagation model that you, uh, mod you optimize over each of the weights in the layer, layer wise. Oh, ah, okay, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this is our setting. Um, first of all, this whole thing is not our idea. So uh, there have been works before uh, that already looked at the simplification and uh, they had the, exactly this motivation using matrix factorization or matrix sensing to somehow understand the training procedure in neural networks. And for example, there were works that look at matrix factorization for two layers and got some, um, some formulas for the eigenvalue evaluate, evolution. There were works that looked at matrix sensing also for two layers and could show that if you have certain measurements that gradient descent approximates low rank solutions, if you stop at a good point. Um, there were works that looked at the matrix sensing for very special cases where you have commuting measurements. And here it was interesting that they could show in some asymptotic sense if the initialization goes to zero and if the gradient descent converges, then you will approximate a nuclear norm minimizer. So there is always this connection to low rankness. Nuclear norm is the natural low rank uh, regularizer. And there are many more. So here I just list some of them. Um, if you're interested, follow, follow the path and go through the references in them and you find even more. But what, what our work makes, or what makes our work different from the one that were already existing is in a sense that we concentrated on the matrix factorization model, but we wanted really to have quantitative convergence analysis for all layer depths. Um, so we didn't want to assume that it converts, and we wanted to be uh, general in the number of layers. And what we got out of this was mainly those three points. So first of all, it was quite interesting that we noticed if we initialize our um, factors all by alpha times the identity, um, then we have some kind of spectral cutoff. That means we could show that in this case, the product matrix WK converges to a W infinity. And this W infinity 
is diagonalized by the same matrices as the ground truth, but the eigenvalues are cut off. In some sense, ReLU is applied to them. So only the positive eigenvalues survive. This is somehow strange, but the thing is, it seems to be a very pathological case. Because as soon as you change the initialization of just one factor by a tiny bit, so beta can be very small, you directly get convergence to the ground truth. So this cutoff phenomenon is something that might happen, but it is rather a special thing. And maybe what is most important is that those convergence results above, we connected to um, non-asymptotic bounds, which means we got quantitative convergence analysis and could use this, so the convergence rates of the different eigenvalues, to give really good predictions at which time the product matrix has a certain effective rank. And I will go now into detail for all of those three points, and then you will, you will also see how, how this looks in, in numerical simulations. So first result on this spectral cutoff. Um, the assumptions are we have a certain number of layers that we fix in the beginning. We have a ground truth that is symmetric, so it can be diagonalized in this way. And we initialize with alpha times identity for some alpha. Then if our step size is sufficiently small, the product matrix converges to the spectral cutoff matrix. and for each lambda i, so for each eigenvalue of the ground truth matrix, we can find a time such that if the iterations exceed this time, um, the error of this eigenvalue approximation will be bounded of, at the order of epsilon. And the time depends on the magnitude of the lambda, on the accuracy that we want to achieve, on the mag uh, initialization magnitude and the step size. And there's a good reason I don't give you the exact expression for this. It is very technical and contains very much, many, de many details. So for the moment, just notice an important thing. The product matrix WK always stay diagonalizable by the same U that is also in the ground truth. So they are all the time diagonalized by the same thing. And the error matrix is thus a diagonal matrix. On each diagonal entry, you have, in some sense, the error of this eigenvalue approximation. Just to give you an idea how this time looks like, in a special case, if we have at least three layers, if our accuracy and our initialization magnitude are smaller than the, than the eigenvalue we are interested in approximating, then this time is approximately composed of two terms. The first term depends on the magnitude of lambda i and alpha, so the initialization, and the second term on lambda i and the accuracy we want to achieve. So first, what we see is the smaller an eigenvalue, the longer it takes. The smaller the initialization, the longer it takes. And the better the accuracy we want to have, also the longer it takes. So this, this is somehow what we can see out of this formula. And we also have an influence of the layers, which is a bit more complicated to, to understand. How does this look like if you run an experiment? Here we have a ground truth that has 10, 7, 5, and minus 5 as eigenvalues. And here you see how the eigenvalues of the product matrix evolve. So you see the positive eigenvalues are approximated according to their magnitude. So the larger the eigenvalue, the faster it's approximated. And the negative eigenvalue minus five just stays zero. So this cannot be approximated. This black dash line is approximately the time t identity l if you plug in lambda i five. So you see the prediction of this non-asymptotic result is quite accurate. I don't remember what the epsilon was we took for, for computing this TID, um, but maybe 10 to the minus one or something like that. Okay, just to give you a short proof sketch, the main idea is, well, the iterates are diagonal matrices if you 
diagonalize them by u, they stay diagonal, and the eigenvalue dynamics by the identical initialization decouple. So you can reduce it to one-dimensional dynamical systems, um, which describe the, the um, i-th eigenvalue of the product matrix. And this you can transfer into continuous dynamics. And these are easy, easier to analyze. So here you can get the expression for the T identity L from. And then in the end, you have to control the error between the discrete and the continuous dynamics. And there is a lot of technical details in between, which I won't go into right now. So what is different if we perturb one of the factors? So you see basically almost the same theorem. The main difference is the first product factor is now perturbed a bit. And we get convergence to the ground truth. The error is now bounded for arbitrary lambdas that are at least at dominating the, the initialization magnitude. So it doesn't matter anymore whether they are positive or negative. What changes as well, I haven't highlighted it here, that the time is a bit different. It depends on alpha and beta. And um, what, we, what, we can, what we can say here again, it's very technical to write it down, but you can easily express it in terms of the previous T. So this T identity was the time for the exact identical initialization. And you see, if an eigenvalue is positive, then um, the time is the same as for the identical initialization case. If you have a negative eigenvalue, then you need a certain additional time in which the evolution first goes to zero and then at some point switch a sign for one of the factors. And then you have the same time TID, but starting with initialization magnitude beta. So there seems to be some extra time that is necessary to recover uh, the negative eigenvalues. And in fact, this is also what you see in the simulation. So in the same simulation as before, you see that now the minus five eigenvalue is recovered at some time, but although five and minus five are the same magnitude, minus five takes much longer because first somehow the dynamic is drif dri driven into the zero and at some point it changes sign and then goes down. Again, I will give you a brief proof sketch. So it's really sketch. Um, the decoupling works as before. So having uh, this slight change in the initialization doesn't change that your diagonalizability stays the same. Um, the only difference is that you have one, evolu one dimensional evolution for the first factor and one eigenvalued evolution for the remaining factors. And if a lambda i is positive, then basically everything stays the same. The only difference is that you have to take care of this dynamic in a separate case. If your lambda i is negative, then the idea is to look at those two quantities. So you first look at the difference between the first factor and the second uh, and the remaining factor evolutions, and you look at the difference of the squares. And what you then can see is that this difference is monotonically increasing while this is going to zero. This means if the, the squared eigenvalues um, converge to the same thing in the first and last factor, positive and negative, but the real ones are going into different directions. So the first factor, the, the difference between the first factor and the remaining factors keeps increasing. And since the remaining factors go to the positive eigenvalue, the, uh, the first factor can only go to the negative eigenvalue. And this gives you the possibility to reconstruct negative eigenvalues. So one of the factors makes it negative and the remaining factors just stay on the positive side. And then again, you have to go through the, the pain of controlling all those convergence rates by uh, using continuous systems and translating it to, to, the, to the discrete ones. Okay, and having all this, this is now really a meta theorem informal in some sense, 
you can predict effective rank approximations. So given your ground truth with, we just talk about positive eigenvalues here now, um, you can ask for a certain R. So for example, R equal one. And if your iterations are in a certain time regime, then you know that the product matrix will have an effective rank that is approximately the same as the effective rank of your ground truth, but the best rank R approximation. So for example, if you take R equal one, the best rank one approximation, um, and here epsilon and alpha, de alpha determine again what the intervals look like. This is now a bit hard to digest. Most important is that you see this R of is effective rank, which means the nuclear norm over the operator norm. This is some number between one and the rank. So it is a kind of generalization of the rank. Um, and the best rank R approximation is really a spectral cutoff. So it's a matrix where you set all eigenvalues to zero apart from the first R. And what you see then if you do simulations, so here we take as a ground true um, one that has three eigenvalues that are non-zero, so it's rank three. And the eigenvalues are of magnitude 10, five, and one. What is now interesting, if you do, if you run gradient descent, the error, the approximation error, decays in certain waterfall shape. And these plateaus somehow correspond to plateaus where the effective rank of the product matrix seems to stabilize. With our theorem in, in the mind, you can check what those numbers are where the plateaus happen. So the first is one. One is the effective rank of the best rank one approximation of the ground truth, because a rank one matrix has always effective rank one. The second plateau is 1.5. This is the effective rank of the best rank two approximation of the ground truth. 10 plus five is 15 over 10 is 1.5. And these blue shaded regions are the time intervals that were computed by using our results. So you see, they give a quite accurate prediction, but um, I, I won't, well, I won't put it on the, under the carpet. It really depends on the alpha uh, size. It depends on the epsilon. So the accuracy you choose here, whether this time interval is non-zero or not. It's more to, to highlight that those non-asymptotic analysis really tells us something about, about the um, evolution of effective rank of the iterates. The proof sketch, I, I guess I can mainly skip it. The idea is just you distinguish dominant eigenvalues, so the one that are really relevant, where you check at which time they are approximated well. From non-dominant eigenvalues, those are the ones where, uh, where it's important that the approximation still is almost zero. So as long as k is less than t plus, you know that they will be close to zero and neglectable eigenvalues, which are the ones that are already dominated by the initialization. And then you bound each of those errors by using the non-asymptotic results from before. And this gives you this interval size, t minus one less or equal k less or equal t plus. And t minus and t plus depend on our times from before. Okay, so this is, this, this is basically the first part. Um, we, we just looked at matrix factorization. And as I already said, a huge drawback of this is that um, the ground truth is basically determined. So in the end, if you have global uh, convergence to global minimizers, you always end up with the ground truth. There's no possibility that the, any implicit bias uh, influences what limit you converge to. So what happens if one introduces some subsampling? So the ground truth is not uniquely determined anymore. And here we already saw there were works on matrix sensing, but since this matrix sensing leads really to a strong coupling of all those weights, we, we uh, decided to first concentrate on vector factorization, so a simpler model. 
And um, to get into this, let me just remind you of, of sparse recovery. So the state of the art stuff on sparse recovery is assuming that you have some unknown signal or vector X in high dimensions and you take linear measurements that are much fewer than the ambient dimension of X, then in general, you know that X cannot be uniquely recovered from, from Y if M is less than N. But if your A behaves well, so it preserves some kind of information and X is as sparse, so has a special structure, sparsity, I guess most of you know it, means that only few of the entries are non-zero, then it might happen that this X is really the unique solution to, to this uh, measurement process, so the unique sparse solution. And for example, if A um, satisfies certain conditions like null space properties or restricted isometry properties, then we can even reconstruct X by minimizing a square loss. So this is very familiar to what we did in matrix factorization only without the A. And we add a regularization by the L1 norm. Here you see one really needs this explicit regularization. The question is now, can we in this setting also use this overparameterization to get rid of the L1 regularization? Which means instead of having only a Z over which we minimize, we write a Hadamard product of L factors where each is a vector of the dimension N. And the question is now if gradient descent is applied to this, uh, to this square loss without any regularization, do we see again some kind of implicit regularization? And here the minimum is not uniquely determined anymore because there might be many explanations of the data. Again, um, we are not the first doing this. Um, there already have been works on this uh, vector setting the main drawback of the first two that I mentioned here is that they really require S squared measurements, which is suboptimal if you know the field. So what you would like to have would be rather S times log N. And you need to stop, uh, stop your gradient descent early. Then you can well approximate your ground truth. Another line of work, which is more related to what we did is if gradient flow, so here it's gradient flow, not gradient descent, if you initialize it with a small magnitude, and if it converges to global optimality, then the limit approximates an L1 minimizer. The drawback of this result is you need to assume that it converges to global optima, and only for two layers, it's non-asymptotic in the sense that it tells you how small you have to pick alpha. For L greater than two, you need to go to the limit zero. And even for L equal two, you re it requires exponentially small initialization, exponentially small in the ambient dimension and the accuracy. In comparison, what we got, and here I first state a simplified version, is that if we take any number of layers, and we define X tilde to be the product of such factors where each of the factors follows individually the gradient flow, initialization is identical, then the limit exists and it lies in a set of positive solutions. So we, we converge to, to a global optimizer in the positive orphaned. And for any accuracy epsilon, if our initialization magnitude is sufficiently small, the L1 norm of this limit point will be epsilon close to the minimal L1 norm on the positive orphaned over all possible data solutions. Now, three remarks. First, by assuming here again this alpha identity thing, we again have some kind of a restriction to positive solutions. And this causes all this restriction to the positive orphan. In fact, this also is related to this assumption we make here 
I, I ignored it when saying the theorem, but this is a technical assumption on A. It requires that there exists at least one truly positive solution of the system. Um, and this is not so nice. So those two things are somehow limiting the, the expressivity of this result. What is nice about the result is that um, this H, which I also ignore for the moment here, is for all possible layer sizes explicitly given. So if you give me an epsilon, um, then I can tell you how small you have to initialize to reach eps epsilon good approximation of the L1 minimizer. And um, what is interesting is if L is greater than two, it's not exponentially small in epsilon and n anymore. It becomes polynomial. So you benefit of having deeper factorizations. Now, what about the drawbacks? The thing is, this positive orphaned restriction is caused by our type of initialization. And here, instead of changing the initialization, we make the factorization a bit more complicated. So we just make a difference of two factorizations such that this can recover the positive part and this the negative part of the solution. And with this new functional, which we call L over plus minus, we get now a more general version of our previous result. The beginning is the same, just for U and V. The difference is now we only require a solution that has no zero entries. This is much less restrictive. Basically, it's fulfill fulfilled for almost any matrix A um, and for almost any Y that you pick. Um, the limit is now the limit of the difference. And this exists is also a non-zero solution. And you get um, approximation of the L1 minimizer on the whole data. OK, and um, since I have. I think five to 10 minutes left. Um, I will give you some, some idea of the proof in the positive case, just that you get, get a feeling for what has been done here. Um, and just to remind you, in the positive case, this is our loss function. So we have this factorization. And our factor, uh, our, our product is somehow defined by this uh, gradient flow. So how does the proof work? First is we simplify the loss function and the dynamics, similar as in the matrix case. The second is, and here I want to emphasize, this was a really great idea of Edward. Edward is here. So um, if there also appear questions on that, he, he will be as well here to answer things. We introduced a, a strictly convex entropy functional in some sense. So a functional that was auxiliary and which helped us to analyze everything. And uh, by this functional, basically one, one only had to follow then the, the argument. It, it, it was, so my part here was then more helping Edward polishing his great idea. Um, and this allowed us to characterize the limit as well. Um, so the first step is we reduce the setting. By assuming that we have all factors initialized identical, we know that they stay identical, which means we can reduce everything to a functional where only one x appears, which is taken to the L in the Hadamard power. This is just simplification. The second step is defining the solution entropy. And don't, don't bother with the, with the specific form. It's not that important for what follows. And um, what you should realize is that everything here is applied entry-wise. So those functions are very simple. They are just applied entry-wise to everything. And this entropy functional is, can be made for every Z that you pick. So in some sense, it measures the distance to Z if you fix Z in a certain matrix. And what is more, it grows to infinity if you go to the borders of the positive orphan. Those are somehow the features you should remember for the, for the moment. OK, first, this solution entropy is strictly convex with respect to x. So it is a very nice type of functional. And it has, the, as a unique minimizer, 
the one over Lth root of z, which means it really measures in some sense the difference between x and z, so the distance. The second, and this was maybe the core observation, is that if your z is a solution of the system and your x follows the flow, then as long as x stays positive, the decay rate along the entropy doesn't depend on z. So for all possible solutions of the system z, the, diff the distance of the trajectory decreases at the same rate. And this rate depends on how, how, how large the loss is at the point x. So finally, we can put this together. First, one uses that the entropy functional goes to infinity at the borders of the orthond, that x always stays positive along the trajectory. Second, since all the entropy functions are bounded from below, one can conclude that at some point the trajectory has to, the, the decay along the entropy functional has to stop, which in returns means that this has to become zero. So just from the boundedness of the entropy functionals, one directly gets that the trajectory will converge to global optimality. And now this is more technical and this I will skip the details. One can use again the solution entropy to deduce that there is real convergence of the trajectory. So not only in value of the loss functional, but of the trajectory itself. And that this minima, uh, the trajectory limit can be characterized as the z that minimizes the height in entropy between initialization and minimal entropy. Um, this might take a bit to, to digest it, but in some sense, you have many entropy functionals. At each, you start with your trajectory, and you know all the trajectories will cover the same height difference. So the one where you where you reach the minimum has to be the one where this gap is the smallest. Um, this is somehow the idea behind that. And with this characterization, you can characterize the limit x infinity. So you know that x infinity will be the minimizer of a certain functional. Don't, don't try to, to get the exact form. The only thing you need to see is that this minimization property can now be used to bound this difference. Because the difference between the L1 norm and any z, uh, the L1 norm of the x infinity and any z is in the positive orthond just the difference between the inner products. And this is what is appearing here in this functional. So you can somehow compare this difference by using that x infinity minimizes this functional. This is the rough idea. And you end up with your result. Just a couple of remarks in the end. The numerical simulations fit to what we got out theoretically. And this result allows sparse recovery if you have m greater s log m, if your matrix A additionally has some restricted isometry property, null space property, whatever you like, just some of those reconstruction properties. What we found out, so just two weeks ago, um, Dominic Stöger, who is a colleague at uh, KU, he pointed me to uh, this paper um, where we now know that they use the same proof technique in a different, they state it differently, but they use it for mirror descent in two layer matrix sensing. So in fact, this also works for matrix factorization. We weren't aware of that. But what is nice about it is that they formulate it in terms of Bregman divergence, which means what we call entropy is in some sense can be interpreted as a Bregman divergence. And um, it looks like if we use the Bregman divergence framework, we even get rid of this technical assumption. So it seems this is rather an artifact of our proof at the moment 
but I I kept with I, I stayed with the stick to the to the original results since we still have to proofread everything that is it's really fine. So future extensions would be of course random initialization would be something that is interesting or understanding if the stochasticity in gradient descent adds some some additional implicit bias then it would be interesting to have non-symmetric ground truths or matrix sensing, so the more general frameworks. Non-linearities, of course, would be the nice thing ever because it would give lead us back to the neural network setting. And what is also a direction one could look at is going back from matrix factorization to this data-dependent model. Because then the question is also, does the implicit bias maybe also connect to the, to the structure in data? Right, but so more than enough to still cover. And if you are interested in knowing more about here below, you find our two works on the topic at the moment. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Johannes, for a great talk. So let me stop recording.